All right, integration. Now, whereas derivatives were finding slopes of tangents, and then we saw some crazy applications we could do with that, integration, integrals, is to find area under curves. So what we're going to be looking at now with integration is you know how to find the area of certain shapes, right? Ooh, you could find the area of that no problem. But what happens if you had a parabola and you wanted to find this area underneath the parabola? Well, you could separate it into a shape here. And that would be an easy one because that would be a rectangle. But the problem is that curve. How do we deal with that curve? So what we're going to be looking at is how do we get an idea for calculating this? It's based on Archimedes was looking at it already. He said, I know rectangles, so why don't I just make little rectangles and make as many little rectangles as I can? How close will my area be to the actual area? It'll be pretty close. It won't be perfect but it'll be pretty close. And if I made my rectangles smaller, it'll be closer. And if I made them even smaller, it'll be closer. And if we took the limit as h goes to 0 kind of idea, it'll get even closer until it gets so close that it's exactly the same area. OK, that is what we're leading to. So anti-differentiation or integration is the opposite. So earlier, we had some questions where we went backwards. We were already doing integration when we did that. However, going backwards is sometimes more difficult than going forward. For example, uh, I used to have a neighbor that, first of all, if you tried to mix gravel and dirt together, that would be easy but doing the opposite after it's mixed together and separating the gravel from the dirt is hard. Okay, So sometimes you can go one way with differentiation and think, think of some of the product law or quotient law ones that we did and then it was a show that question where we simplified it. Once it was simplified, if you had to work back from the simplified one back to the original, that might be hard because you have to think, oh, that's right, I added a 2x and a 5x. Well, how would you think to separate those two? How do we come up with the, the strategies of working backwards when, when that comes up? And since this is an important thing that we're going to have to remember, the fact that the derivative of a constant is 0, we're going to get an infinite amount of functions when we do the integration because we can always do plus 7 at the end, or plus 10, or plus whatever number we want. So if you have a derivative, then working backwards would have been the original function plus c. So we're going to have to remember to add plus c every single time, and we call that the antiderivative. Some definitions here. When we do that plus c, we've got an indefinite integral. That's the, that is the integral sign, and we call the function inside the integrand. But x is a variable, as you know, and when we do the plus c at the end, it's just a constant. So now, here's just a little flow chart. If you start with a function, going one direction is differentiation. Going the opposite direction is anti-differentiation. So whatever function you have, you can go back and forth. So just some ideas to show that they're related to each other. Now, remember what we did when we differentiated an, a power rule. All we did was brought that number out in front and subtracted 1 from the exponent. So if those were our two steps for doing the power rule, 
how would we reverse those steps? How would we go backwards? Okay, and we had this question before. Now, sometimes what you did is you probably just added one to the exponent, right? And then figured out what number had to be in front. And in this case, no number would have to be in front. As a process, though, if we look at our steps, and our steps were subtract one from the exponent, so the first thing we did was add one to the exponent, what would be the opposite of this step? Instead of saying multiply the front by the number, the opposite would be to divide the front by the number. So whereas in the past, when we worked backwards, you just figured it out, what we're going to do now is say, well, I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, and then I'm going to divide instead of multiply by whatever that exponent was. In this case, if the fives are going to cancel, you're going to get the same thing. Where this is going to be nice is you're going to get some questions that aren't so easy to work backwards from. This second one here, 12x to the 2, this one's pretty easy to work backwards because in the past you would just add 1 to the exponents and you could just see what number had to be here, right? Has to be a 4. So we're not necessarily adding 1 to the exponent and dividing by that number, but that would work. Of course, with each of these, we should also write plus c at the end because it could be any constant. Yeah, just take a moment. Now, if we did an example 2.5 here, where we did the derivative of 5 thirds x to the 7, if the derivative was this, adding 1 to the exponent wouldn't be hard. So this is what our derivative is. We want to find x the actual function, adding 1 to the derivative will give us 16 over 9. What number goes in front? And now all of a sudden, since it's fractions, it's like, ugh. It's not quite as easy to see what it should be right away. So this is where this technique of, if we leave the number in front and then divide by our exponent, because that was the opposite of multiplying, it's going to be a little bit more helpful because now you have a fraction divided by a fraction. So you can multiply by the reciprocal. And you're like, oh, it was supposed to be 45 over 48. That's what I thought. Or maybe you'd already simplified that to 15 sixteenths, to s and that made total sense. But seeing the 15 sixteenths in front does not jump out, I guess remember the plus c, doesn't jump out as easily as the 4 did when that number was there. So what do we do? We add 1 to the exponents. That's the opposite of subtracting. Then we divide our function by the new exponent. And finally, we have to remember to add that c because there could have been any number at the end, any constant there, that could be possible. So here we have our general rules for the power law. And there are four examples there for you to try on your own. I'll put the answers up in a bit. Quick check of your first answers. So that integral, and whenever we write an integral, we always write dx here to say which variable we're doing the integration for. 11x over 6 divided by 6 plus c, where c is any real number. x to the negative 3, and we're doing that integral. Add 1 to the exponent and divide by that. I'm not going to deduct if you don't say c is an element of reals. I'm going to assume that it is an element of the real numbers. But for right now, we're doing that just to show 
that it could be anything. I'm not sure if like plus C is what's always used. I'm sure everybody who's doing it would understand what you're what you're saying. I'm not sure if it's universally accepted that as soon as you write plus C that it's constant with integration, but generally it would be seen that way. The, I am, they're not going to deduct if you forget that C is all real numbers. They will deduct if you forget plus C. So here we have to change it first to an x to the half. Again, add one to the exponent. And then once you simplify that complex fraction, you get 20 over 3. So you'll find even the ones that you used to be able to do quickly just because you could see what it was when you worked backwards, this technique is so fast and easy to use that you'll do it automatically. You'll just add one to the exponent and divide by that exponent and then simplify from there because it's so quick and easy to do. And our last example here, again, we change it to rational exponent, dividing by a fraction, then multiply by the reciprocal. And we get our answer. Now, just like we had a sum and difference rule for differentiation, it makes sense that if you could just do the derivative of separate things and add them up, you can do the integral of separate things and add them up. So what this formula is saying is if you have two functions added together and you want to find the integral of them, you can find the integral of each one separately. So there's four examples there for you to try. All right, let's see how you did on the first one. So you can take the integral of each thing separately. And of course, that first step, you probably will never write because it just takes too long. But that's the idea. Take the integral of the first one, take the integral of the second one, take the integral of the third one, and then do plus c. Now, technically, there would have been a, a plus C for the first one, a plus D for the second one, a plus E for the third one, three different possible constants. But when you add all those together, you would still have one constant. And so you can just write plus C at the end. This is a product. And the thing that's going to get you now that we're working backwards is sometimes you'll say to yourself, work backwards, and then your brain will just say, oh, product, product rule, and you'll work forwards, or vice versa. So part of the problem with integration is you've been deriving for so long, sometimes you're going to mix the two up. And even though you know you're supposed to go in one direction, you're going to do the opposite. The same thing probably happened to you in elementary, middle school, even sometimes in high school. You know, one times one is two. Your brain sees multiplication. You're so good at adding 1 times 1 that you add. Right? So we've got to be really careful that we make sure we do the right thing. This is integration. We want to work backwards. We see a product, and our body might immediately react to try to do the product rule, but that's differentiation. So first, we're going to multiply this out, and then we can do the integral of each thing separately. Part of the process of, process of integration will be how do we change what we're looking for so that it matches something that we can do the integral of. So for this one, again, you might be tempted to use the quotient rule, but that's differentiation. You want to find the integral. Here's another form of asking that same question. Find the integral of y dx. Here's the equation for y, so it's telling us to simplify and put that into our integral. And if we factor it, we can turn it into something that we can do the integral for. 
and it's x squared over 2 minus 4x plus c. Just to switch the variables so we don't get so used to using x that when another variable comes along, we say, oh, I don't know how to do this question. So if I change the variables in my function to u, and I ask then if I want to find the integral, then I'll need to put du. Okay? So a little bit of focus on notation here. So when I have du, that means we're going to integrate with respect to u. U is the variable that we have to do the integration for. Notice in this last question when it was initially written, what is the integral of y dx? Well, there's no x's in there right now. It's just a y. So I need to write my equation with the x's in there in order to do the integration. So for this one, change the u cube root of u to u to the one third. Then we can integrate, add 1 to the exponent and divide by that number, simplify our complex fraction. And so that is the properties of when you're adding and subtracting functions. Just the same as when you could take the derivative of each term separately, you can integrate each term separately. Some other things we noticed in, der in deriving things that's the same for working with integrals is when you have a number multiplied in front of the function, that constant number in front, that coefficient, didn't affect the derivative. We just multiplied whatever derivative we got by that. Same thing with integration. If you have a constant times by a function, that constant can come out in front. And you can integrate it just like you saw it before. So here in A, we've got 4 over x cubed. We know that the derivative, if once we change that x to x to the minus 3, is negative 12x to the minus 4. And so this 4 out in front really just didn't affect the derivative at all. It just meant that we multiplied our final answer by 4 as well. If we were doing the integral of this, now we're doing the integral of 4 integral x to the negative 3. That 4 out in front, we can do our integration like normal, and then we can just simplify afterwards. So try this one. So that 30 can come out in front. And when you integrate, add 1 to the exponent and divide by that, multiply by the reciprocal. If you simplify it, you get 25 u to the 6 fifths plus c. Now, if integration is working backwards and deriving is working forwards, does it make sense that if you do the integral of a derivative, you just don't go anywhere? Because if you do the integral, you take one step backwards, then you take the derivative, you take one step forward. Where do you end up? Exactly where you started with mostly. Okay? Because in this case, if I'm going to take the integral of the derivative, well, I'm going to end up exactly where I started with, so I'm going to start get right back to f of x where I started with. But I still have to do plus c because I did the integral last. Whereas if you did it the other way, 
If you took the derivative of the integral, then there would be no plus c. Depends what you do last. If you do the integral last, there will still be a plus c as a constant. If you did the derivative last, there would be no plus c as a constant. So here's the question. Find the integral of the derivative of 5x squared. The integral and the derivative are going to cancel each other out. You can do the work if you want. You can work inside and say, what's the derivative of 5x squared? It's 10x. And then what's the integral of 10x? Well, it would be add 1 to the exponent, divide by 2. What do you know? We get 5x squared again. But we have to remember the plus c. So the shortcut would be to say, oh, I could have gone directly from here to here as long as I remember to add the c at the end. Because doing the derivative of the integral are just taking one step forward and one step back. You end at the same place that you started with. But if you were doing the other way, if you took the integral first and then the derivative, again, they're going to cancel each other out. But now there's no plus c. Why is that? Well, if I did the integral first, I'd add 1 to the exponent and divide. So I would get 5x to the minus 2 divided by negative 2. I'd write the plus c. And then when I take the derivative of that, well, the derivative of 5x to the minus 2 over minus 2 becomes, bring the negative 2 out in front, subtract 1 from the exponent. But then the derivative of our constant will be plus 0. And once we simplify this, we just get what we started with inside. But now there's no plus c.